Well, welcome back, everybody. Hope you had a even though short restful break. So uh, we now have the opportunity to hear from uh, our friend John Dunn, our birthday boy, uh, and very much looking forward to what you have to say, John. Thanks very much, Al. Um, and um, my friend Barry Hershey, who might still be online here, I don't know, uh, once called me a Buddhist theologian. And <laughs> so I, I like to take the opportunity when I'm here at this amazing event on a yearly basis to kind of be deliberately speaking from a kind of Buddhist standpoint. So what I'm going to do is take some ideas out of Buddhist philosophy and articulate them a bit for you. And then uh, I'm going to see what, whether I can apply them to our current context or so the kind of inflection point that we seem to be at right now in our world. So uh, in the spirit of that, I'm just going to start with, a, with an invocation, a kind of traditional invocation, uh, as one would at the beginning of a, of a talk as a Buddhist theologian of a kind. So here we go. Vidu the Gabana Jala Gambiru Dara Murtai, Namaha Samanta Bandraya, Samantha Sparana Tishe, Nabavo, Napya Bavo, Sinu Chayanuna Pishash Vataha, Nanichanapi and it just twam, Adwaya Yanamos to tea. Say then Kuki Kana Bezagi Dala Deva Mumba Rabza and the Kadan Tandrishan Lotopa Yi Lodo Boba Namazo. Omanchogi Yang Bodra Nedus and Sangi Kungi no one yeet runs and chokung and tunja but Zami Lami Samla Sua de. So it's been quite a rich day. And I suspect that many of you are rather tired, especially, especially those of you in Europe. So I'll make everything easier by giving this talk in Tibetan. No, I'm just kidding. Um, uh, it is, uh, uh, it's been a long day. And uh, I think though, really, I'm a simpleton at heart. And uh, I've, we've heard some amazing talks that are just uh, incredibly rich. So mine will be maybe quite easy in some ways. But there are some very simple points that I hope to make, and I think you'll be able to detect them rather easily as I go along. Uh, I want to begin, actually, by just pointing out uh, that, you know, the title of my talk is what we, see, what we See is Not Water, What We Believe is Not True. I came up with that title before I heard these other talks, and it still applies. That first line there, what we see is not water, really comes out of the particular kind of philosophy that underlies the non-dual traditions like Mahmudra in Dzogchen in Tibet, or Chan in China, Zen in Japan, Sion in Korea, which is called Yoga Chara philosophy, the philosophy literally of the practice of yoga. And this is a perspective that emerges historically around possibly the second to third century in classical India. And its perspective is, is in some ways characterized as philosophical idealism, not a subjective idealism, because it's a denial of there being an external world, but it's also therefore a denial of there being a kind of internal world. So both of these poles collapse, the object pole and the subject pole both collapse, and yet they don't collapse into nothingness. They collapse into, in a sense, experience itself, to put it very simply. So the, the core of this philosophy is an idea known as the three natures, which is that we have an ongoing flow of experience, and that experience manifests with this subject-object duality. And the claim is, and there are, also, of course, arguments to, that support this, the claim is that that subject-object duality is false. It's actually a distortion in our experience. In fact, that sense of there being a world out there and a self in here is precisely what produces our suffering. So that our entire experience of this suffering world of samsara is actually rooted in that sense of this duality, of there is a world out, out there and a self in here. And that sense of duality can be dissolved through certain types of philosophical analyses, but also especially through experience itself. Uh, when we have that dissolution, we experience then that flow. So on the one hand, we can experience that flow as having this subject-object structure. And on the other hand, we can experience that flow as uh, uh, devoid of that subject-object structure. And when we experience it that way, this is what's called the perfect nature. That is the ultimate on this system. That's what, in a sense, is really going on. That is the true nature of our world and of ourselves. Much more we could say here, but I don't really want to dwell too much on, uh, on that system 
because you know obviously uh, some of this might not stick in the craw my some of this might stick in the craw i should say it might not be easy to accept uh, the, uh philosophical idealism is not an especially popular position these days but there are a couple of features that we can um, draw out of this that i think are really interesting and relevant to where we find ourselves these days one of them is that the, the very term for the kind of our ordinary experience, which is the ex experience of where there's a world out there and self in here, right, sounds like it's very individual and very isolated, but actually, in other words, that it focuses on individual experience. But really, as when we examine this philosophy, what we, we, what we find in a way that is somewhat unchar uncharacteristic of Buddhist thought otherwise, is a kind of intuition about the role of social reality in the construction of our own experience. So on the one hand, yes, we could say the very content of what we're experiencing is not something outside of consciousness. But the question then becomes, where do these contents come from? Well, they actually come from this, the, there's a term called the alia vidnana. Many of you may, may be familiar with this term, what's called the storehouse consciousness. There is, in a sense, a kind of place in which the seeds of past experience or the traces or the perfume, the vasana of past experience has been placed in the mind. And then under the right circumstances, it manifests in experiences, in perceptual experiences and what are called the six active consciousnesses, the five senses and the mental consciousness. And so what you're seeing right now on this model is actually not some something being caused by objects out there or stimulus lie out there, but your, the actual contents of your perception, your sort of phenomenal content is actually the result of this, in, this process of the mind itself manifesting through past experience and present triggers, if you like. Where does that all come from? It's not just coming from one mind or my mind or your mind. It's coming from our collective mind, but not all of us. It's coming from those of us who are sharing a particular kind of life world, an intersubjective life world. So a key kind of insight of this approach is that even our perceptual experience, even the sort of, you know, as, as raw content as we can get in terms of our perceptual experience, even that is the result of a kind of intersubjective world that is constructed through also past experience. Present experience uh, produces, in a sense, it, rather present experience is the result of the combination of our intersubjective reality and our past experiences. And when we are having these experiences, we're not having them willy-nilly. Rather, they are actually very much driven by our uh, thirst, if you like, our seeking for happiness and pleasure and our, uh, and our drive to avoid pain and suffering. And however, the, in order for us to engage in this way with the world, which is just an apparent world, a dreamlike world, in order for to, us to engage in this way, what we need to do is construct concepts. So to the extent that we can talk about there being something like a kind of raw experience, this is largely inaccessible to us in, in our ordinary lives. Instead, what counts as our sort of accessible experience is actually highly conceptualized, highly categorized. And those concepts, and here's something in which uh, the work of uh, uh, Francisco Varela and Evan and others, uh, the idea of the inactive account, uh, those concepts are not, again, just happening willy-nilly. They are constructed precisely for the purpose of engaging in with this world, a world that is mutually constructed through subject and object, through self and world, mutually constructed through the act of sense-making that those concepts allow they allow us to uh, they allow us to in a sense engage with what, that which we wish to obtain get our affordances and avoid the dangers avoid the undesirable so that notion here we're, uh, that concepts are in a sense are we live a sort of conceptual life a conceptually constructed life uh, even at what seems to be the perceptual level we again can ask where are these concepts coming from and those concepts are exactly mutually formed within a particular life world, not in all life worlds. And this is where that metaphor or, or the, the, the title of the talk becomes relevant. What we see is not water, is referring to a very famous example that appears in a number of sutras and is cited by a number of philosophers, which is the, the notion that what we humans see as water 
the gods, those living in the celestial realms, they, they see it as nectar, and the pretas, the hungry ghosts, see it as pus. And all three of these perceptions relative to that, when I, and when I say see it, we should really even say more properly conceptualize it, right? So they experience it, but through their conceptual categories as we, as water, the gods as nectar, the, pr the pretas are hungry ghosts, they experience it as pus. And each of them, in a sense, within those life worlds, within those shared life worlds, the, those experiences are veridical. But they are not ultimately veridical because all of those shared life worlds are, in a sense, illusions. They are construct mutual constructions of realities that seem to present themselves as truly objectively real, truly out there, independent of any role that our minds are, whether individually or collectively, might play in the construction of that reality. Rather, that reality simply presents itself as being the objective fact of the matter, so to speak. So that's when we say what we see is not water, the point here is that we seem to be experiencing this kind of objective world, but on this account, actually, this is a matter of construction, and it's not just individual construction, it's a kind of social construction, actually. And so a second feature here, which also I refer to in the title, is what we believe is not true. And another aspect of this philosophical system is that that process of conceptual construction is not picking out categories that are given in some kind of objective world. Obviously, that wouldn't make a lot of sense if we're saying that that world that seems to be out there is nothing other than mind itself or consciousness itself, intersubjective consciousness itself, emerging in the form of world and self or world and mind as, as if they were separate. On that model, obviously, the notion that there could be objective categories existing in the world doesn't make any sense. Instead, what we do is we construct categories. And in our action of constructing categories, two features are especially important, or well, maybe three features. One, just to reiterate, we're constructing those categories not for no reason. We're constructing them in order to get what we want and to avoid what we don't want at the very basic level. And the claim of the philosophers who put this forward, like Dignaga and Dharmakirti, is that even our very high level concepts in some way are built on this very simple model, our conceptual constructions, and they are indeed constructions, they're not picking out natural kinds or categories in the world, that those constructions are all about getting what we want and avoiding what we don't what we don't want. Another feature of them is that since they're not picking out real categories in the world, they're necessarily distorting our experience in a certain way, or they are in a sense, it, they are in a sense foreclosing possibilities. So by focusing on, uh, by deploying one kind of category in a context, we foreclose the possibility of the interpretation of that experience in other ways. Even though that is, other interpretations may be intersubjectively available, they are foreclosed by that act of interpretation. So the act of interpretation, in a sense, excludes what is irrelevant to our immediate purposes and goals. Second, so concepts, it's not just the case that concepts always distort in this way, but also concepts necessarily are incomplete. And here I, I love to think of a story I read had quite an impact on me quite a long time ago when I, I studied a lot of Spanish in university and uh, was a big fan of Jorge Luis Borges and remember this story, Del Rigor en la Ciencia, I think written in 1946. Uh, in which it, it's a, a quite short story, but the, the main point here is that a big, a big trope of this story is that the, uh, the map makers, the geographers of the empire finally got to the point where they tried to make a map that is as large as the empire itself. Right. So rigor in concerning rigor in science is the name of this story. And there's this kind of absurd notion of uh, uh, of objectivism in which we could create a map. We could have an explanatory system that was so complete that it captured every detail of what we're trying to explain. So this is precisely not what's going on in this account. On this account, every, every explanatory system is incomplete, and it's always relative to the particularity of, particularities of that shared life world in which the explanatory system is emerging. Again, by deploying that explanatory system and its assumptions, uh, what is desirable and undesirable, for example, we are always foreclosing possibilities that are actually available in our intersubjective experience. So 
that's a, a very brief account of Yogacara philosophy. Uh, a key point here is that, again, our reality, what we experience as reality, is actually a kind of intersubjectively constructed world, like a dream. Or, or uh, you know, the Wachowski brothers who made the movie The Matrix, of course, were drawing uh, quite explicitly on this model. We're as if living in that kind of a matrix. The exception here, of course, is that there's no real world in which you can awake to. There isn't an account. There isn't a. Uh, uh, there isn't the true world that we can wake out of. We can't. We can't wake out of an intersubjective reality into the objective world. We can't come to some kind of a true system, a true explanation. We can't come to some kind of final account that finally frees us and gives us the real way the world is working. All the all explanatory systems, all attempts at explanation. All stories that we tell ourselves are always going to be in this way distorted and incomplete and always rooted in our shared experience. So thinking now, sort of reflecting back on this moment that we find ourselves in, this moment that could be a kind of inflection point. You know, sometimes I wonder, maybe every generation thinks that, oh, we're at an inflection point, the most important point in history. Here we are. But well, you know, it sure seems that way to me right now. And to some of us, I think. So what is this inflection point? Well, one way to think about where we are is to think of ourselves as living in a highly intersubjective world, a world in which the way in which our reality is constructed is very obviously a matter of groups coming together and sharing realities. And this kind of traces back for me to the notion of very, uh, uh, what I call the uh, cooperation hypothesis, which is that uh, humans have evolved to be cooperators. This is something we find in a number of different disciplines. And there are different accounts. Uh, some accounts say this is driven by allo parenting, for example, the need for human babies to have to be raised by multiple humans, not just by the mother, or uh, an account that's about the capacity, not just for uh, sh uh, joint intentionality and theory of mind, but really for shared intentionality. This is Michael Tomasello's story about how this is. Whichever kind of account we choose, the claim, which seems to be a well-supported claim, is that humans evolved in a way that enables them to collaborate, to cooperate together, to have cooperative cognition, a kind of shared cognitive space that is extraordinary in relationship to other kinds of animals, most likely. We're not sure. There could be, who knows, maybe some cetaceans might have share certain capacities, but certainly our other primate relatives don't have the same degree of capacity for cooperation that is with non-kin, with humans that we're not related to, and that involves kinds of actions that are very flexible, very responsible, very responsive rather to different kinds of environments that enable us to live uh, not just uh, in Madison, Wisconsin, but actually to even live in outer space. So these capacities, this capacity for flex, flexible cooperation, which enables us to talk to each other now over Zoom, is uh, something that humans evolved. Uh, this basic capacity is something that humans evolved with many, many centuries ago. But more recently, starting around perhaps maybe 30,000 years ago, but definitely with the cultural, evolution, uh, cultural revolution of maybe 10 to 12,000 years ago, what we find is another kind of capacity that emerges. We might say that the former capacity is sort of reflected in uh, certain changes in uh, even the human brain that enable a very high level and, uh, and, uh, and co complex level of social cognition. But we also find another kind of development, which is not really about human physiology so much. It's actually about human culture and cultural evolution. And what's, what happens, how or why, who knows? Uh, but what happens is that humans start to develop the capacity to move from the smaller hunter-gatherer bands, maybe as many as 150 people, but probably not more than that, uh, to large-scale societies. Larger and larger scale societies, eventually then the formation of cities, and of course, where we find ourselves now. And one theory about what enables us to form these large scale societies is that we need to find a way of, in a sense, identifying ourselves as being in the same group. Now, in a small, uh, you know, these, these early developments in humans that enable us to be cooperators, 
Um, basically, you could think of as involving a kind of groupishness. We develop the capacity to really very easily fall into groups. And some of you may be familiar with the various types of experiments that, for example, I've got someone at my door there, <laughs> uh, various experiments, uh, um, uh, um, uh, various experience, uh, experiments that are about uh, creating groups um, very quickly with humans by simply putting on different t-shirts of different colors, um, uh, of uh, creating groups by talking about the colors uh, of a person's eyes. So we're very groupish. We very readily form groups. But these are groups that are really kind of based on a type of shibboleth, a type of badge of group identity that are relatively easily formed, but they also come apart fairly easily. To have a large scale society, we need to have something that creates a sense of cohesion that's much more uh, durable and that also is more translocal, that actually doesn't depend upon seeing the badge or the shibboleth of the other in front of you, but actually gives a sense of group identity, even with those whom you can't see, who may actually live hundreds of miles away or even thousands of miles away. And so one theory about how we have developed this capacity is that we have essentially have developed a capacity to live in shared fictional realities, a kind of shared reality of a story or of a narrative, and that we see ourselves as living in these shared fictional realities, of course, without taking them to be fictions. And this capacity to share a narrative, religion appears to may have uh, played a very important role, a cognitive science of religion, Pascal Boyer and others have talked about this, that religion creates this kind of shared sense of reality. Uh, more recently, clearly national formations are the same kind of beast that we're talking about here. The creation of this capacity for a shared reality is really driven by a kind of shared narrative universe that we all that we occupy together. And that shared narrative universe may have a particular storyline, it may have a kind of teleology, a particular, it may be driving toward a particular kind of endpoint. But it may also simply be a kind of set of rules, whether it has that particular, whether it has that particular endpoint or not, it has a set, a shared set of rules. And those shared set of rules enable us to tell stories that make sense within that meta narrative universe. Under those shared rules, there are some particular features that are very important. One of them is, first of all, that these rules can't seem contingent. They must present themselves as real to us, as especially, you might say, inviolable. And for this reason, it's especially rules about the ethical and the moral, at least in the Western context, which seem to be particularly important. Uh, Sean Nichols and colleagues, for example, have done some work that suggests that when we ask, uh, you know, if I change my hair color or even I lose a finger or a limb or what have you, am I still the same person? Sure. But if I change my moral views, am I the same person? No longer. So there's a, some sense in which the moral structures are sense of what is the good, what is right, what is beautiful, that these are especially important for the construction of that shared story. Likewise, these rules don't simply, it's not like we kind of, you know, uh, I don't know, we get to a certain age and we learn the rules and, uh, and then we start to deploy them. We begin to absorb them uh, at infancy. We start to, in a sense, live in that shared narrative space at a very young age, and it literally gets under the skin. A very good example of that is uh, disgust. So disgust is a very culturally variable emotion. Uh, what's disgusting for one person might be not at all disgusting for, for another in different cultures. One of my favorite examples is uh, when I was living in India doing my doctoral research in Benares and Sarnath, I got I had a terrible cold one day and I was went to see the pundit that I was working with on some Sanskrit texts and pulled out my handkerchief and blew my nose and he couldn't help but show how disgusting that was to him. And yet, uh, uh, the way he would blow his nose is uh, if he, it, it, you know, he'd just go over to the sink and go, just 
go shoot it out like that. Or if he was outside, it's just, you know, the side of the road and do it. And of course, many, uh, many Westerners would find that equally disgusting. So disgust has this kind of culture of variation, but it's not as if we can simply ignore it. It's under the skin that react, that disgust reaction is something that feels completely spontaneous and obviously true, right? Obviously this is disgusting. So the, the meta narrative comes with this sense of an axiology, as we can call it, eth what's, what's good, what's the good, what is right, what is beautiful, and so on. And that actually gets under the skin very early in life. Part of what that means, therefore, is it also comes with a certain sense of conviction or certainty. So that the story we tell about what's good, what's right, what is moral doesn't seem like something contingent or something that we made up. It actually feels like something that is the truth, the reality. And so, for example, the very no, and at the same time, again, it forecloses possibilities. So an example for one example would be the idea that one could actually change one's sex. So for some communities uh, in North America, this is not at all an issue, right? We, we're perfectly open to the notion that persons could change their sexual identity or could be born with one gender identity, but really have another gender identity. But for other communities, this is just unthinkable. It is uh, morally reprehensible. And it's not that these, these, present, these judgments present themselves as contingent or just a matter of opinion. They present themselves as the truth. They even feel viscerally as the truth. Another feature, so therefore we can say that there has to be, there's a certain level of conviction or certainty that's built into this kind of meta-narrative universe that we inhabit that enables us to create these large-scale societies, these large-scale groupings that are not about people that we can see, but that enable us to identify as being in the same group with very, with persons that we've never met and possibly will never meet, most, most likely will never meet. Another feature of this that's quite interesting, especially in modernity that we find, is that, the, it, on my view at least, the less local that story is, the more translocal it becomes, and therefore the more effective it is at spreading. And what I mean by this, what I mean is simply this. If that story depends upon what I can see directly in front of me and can therefore be contradicted by my experiences, by uh, what I'm observing, uh, if it depends upon my location in a particular place in space and time, such that I can be outside of the space of the story, then that story is less likely to be effective at spreading. But if it is truly, if it detaches itself from these kinds of local features, including my own local perceptions, then it is much easier for it to spread and to, in a sense, almost like a virus, become something that is capable of uh, um, bringing many more minds into this meta narrative universe. Uh, that Part of what that means, of course, is that as it becomes more translocal, it is less and less dependent upon uh, what we particularly uh, see and experience. But at the same time, part of what reinforces this, even a very translocal story, is very concrete, uh, um, the very concrete working together of enacting the story. So even though it can be a very translocal story, and this is what we find typical of, uh, of the uh, translocal religions, it is these religions nevertheless are enacted in daily experience. And this is where uh, the concept of uh, participatory sense-making really, I think, can come in. That, and of course, this har harkens back to Durkheim, where there's movement together, singing together, chanting together, telling of stories together that enable this community to create those social structures, to, to inhabit that universe, to uh, expand it, and to make it feel ever more real to its participants. So, of course, in the, uh, when, hypothetically, if we suppose that uh, at some point these, these types of uh, large-scale societies start to emerge, that they are in some sense based upon these types of uh, meta narrative universes, perhaps be, uh, tending to be more and more translocal, not tied to a particular place or a particular village. Uh, as they emerge uh, in the beginning, really, they were a means of reducing competition so that uh, if 
if, and this is really in some ways just imaginary, I mean, who, who knows what the process was like, but let's just suppose as there is some evidence to suggest that there were hunter gatherer bands who began to come together for certain occasions, which may were largely probably ritual occasions in which they began to sh share these stories and experience this kind of a shared universe. So it actually was a way of reducing conflict among those bands. They were now beginning to come together in a, as one. And so this is a key feature of this aspect of the human, which is we're, our groupishness is not just for fun, our groupishness is for survival. We individually as humans cannot survive. I mean, there is of course the fantasy, you know, the American fantasy of the individual who's gonna go off in the wilderness and survive on his own, uh, you know, gets his gun and his nice hiking boots and his camouflage clothes and heads out in the universe, into the wilderness. And you, you then do have to ask him like, did you make the gun and the clothes and the boots or uh, where did those come from? So humans as individuals don't survive. We have to survive together, which is of course part of the reason why social exclusion feels so terrible to humans because to be excluded socially for our ancient ancestors was actually, uh, actually a death sentence, right? If you were excluded from your hunter-gatherer band, that was probably the end of the story. So that sense of coming together is not, is not just, again, sort of, you know, for entertainment, it's for survival. It's, it's in a sense, it is, our, uh, it, it is our very possibility of life to, to live together, which also means that when bands of humans come into conflict, when groups of humans come into conflict, a lot can be at stake if the very sense of their communal identity, of their group identity, is up for grabs, is under threat. So when we say that, for example, uh, humans have this groupishness, they come together to survive, to support each other, and then even toward their own in-group, exhibit, for example, a lot of spontaneous altruism, compassion, uh, a readiness to help other members of their in-group, we could say that this is a kind of love, right? So that love actually brings these groups together. We naturally want to connect with other humans. This uh, seems to be very well established. But at the same time, whether or not this is something that's a matter of human culture or whether it's a matter of human, uh, of, you know, the, the actually our genetic history, at the same time, that love can also drive violence toward the outgroup. So it's not simply the case that the, what may have started out as a way of uh, resolving conflict, our ability to live in a shared narrative universe, to tell a story about our world together, that may have started out as a way of reducing conflict. But now, of course, in a, at a time when all of these different universes, all of these different communal identities so readily come into contact with each other, now this is a source of tremendous conflict. And in as much to the extent that those different visions of what is good, the good, what visions of what is the good, visions of what is right, visions of what is beautiful, visions of the way things should be, visions of what's completely unacceptable, to the extent that they conflict, that is not just a, a conflict of, you know, a little argument between neighbors, it's a conflict of realities. It is a threat to the very existence of the groups and therefore of the individuals in those groups. And so it's in some sense can feel like a matter of life and death. Now, this is, I think, the inflection point that we've reached, which is there is no one story. We are clearly at a point here in the world where we don't have a single story that everyone buys into. We might have the kind of modernist fantasy. And uh, you know, here I think of the, uh, of the cultural critic and scholar of religion, Mark Taylor, who once remarked, I think in his book, Alterity, how the West is a bit obsessed with unity and oneness, right? So, and, it, and perhaps then it's no mistake that modernity emerges from the West because the, the notion of unity and oneness is one of the main characteristics of modernity. The very concrete example of that, which I love is, you know, uh, the fast food restaurant, McDonald's. For a while there, uh, and, you know, now we're a little bit in post-modernity, so McDonald's is trying to up its game on this score. But for a while there, every single McDonald's looked exactly the same. And this was not, you know, uh, this is actually a, a virtue, right? It's not a bug. It's a feature. This is a deliberate design. Every McDonald's should look the same because 
That's what we value in modernity. You get the same hamburger everywhere. So that kind of you know, emphasis on we're going to have that one single story that's going to unite us all, or we're going to live in the world government, well, that doesn't seem to be working out so well, actually. I mean, of course, we can re reference Jean-Francois Lyotard and uh, you know, the notion that post-modernity involves uh, this suspicion of these grand meta-narratives. But postmodernism post has, has its issues, certainly. But I do think that one point that we are at now is that there is a kind of angst, if you like, uh, that there, of the breakdown of our own stories. And that, again, the breakdown of the story is an existential threat, that we feel the untruth of our stories, and that this is therefore driving the need to reinforce the stories, to make them truer to ourselves, to deny those, to, to, even, uh, uh, to, to even come into conflict with those who will offer a different stories. So what do we do about this? Well, I'll tell you a quick story about the fir my first teacher, Tara Togo Rinpoche. And uh, I was in Bodh Gaya uh, many years ago, 19, um, I'm not sure when it was, it must've been 1991 maybe. And uh, I was with my friend Tara Doyle who was working on her dissertation in anthropology on pilgrimage in Bodh Gaya, the said to be the place of the enlightenment of the Buddha. And uh, Tara, was, uh, Tara Doyle was interviewing Tara Rinpoche, interesting, same name. And she was, and I was translating, and, and uh, we were talking about there was a certain cave there where supposedly the great Mahasiddha, Shararipa, had actually experienced, I believe it was Yamantaka, who had actually appeared in the cave. And many Tibetans, it was a pilgrimage season, uh, there were many Tibetans going to the cave, and, you know, they would go and do certain kinds of things together, you know, again, creating the story together. And uh, Tara was asking Rinpoche about all the stories that they tell, that the pilgrims tell. And then she finally just asked him, so did Yamantaka really appear in that cave? And so when, when Rinpoche heard this question, the first thing he did was sort of redirect. It was like, uh, hey, do you, see, do you hear that bird? That's a really nice bird. That didn't work. So finally, you know, it's Tara's insisting, insisting, insisting. And then, then finally he says, uh, it's not necessary to say that it's not the case, right? It's not necessary to say that it's not the case. I, so one way of thinking about this is precisely a kind of theme that we've seen maybe sprinkled throughout some of our talks today, which is that the, there's a way of holding that story that knows that it is ultimately untrue, right? Form is emptiness, emptiness is form. That we can, but can we actually assert this kind of a story? Can we believe in it? I remember once Ringo Tuku many years ago at a Mind and Life event once said, we were talking about, uh, you know, kind of the great success of the, of the West, of the modern West and its incredible technologies. And he said, well, you know, if you practice uh, some of these non-dual traditions, it kind of takes a little of that, you know, ambition out of you. It's sort of like, well, you know, whatever, it's okay. We're not being driven by some big story here. You know, we had the, the great success, manifest destiny. It's like, chill out, you know, relax. Maybe that's actually a different kind of story. A story that doesn't have this clinging to what is, what, to its own truth, that is not threatened by, the notion that it's a kind of fiction that actually is empowered by the notion that it's something we create together. So here, I think for us, we're talking about exactly what, what Roshi was talking about earlier today, which is that sort of intersection of creativity and uncertainty. To tell a creative story while knowing we can never come to the certainty that the sort of modernist story, and maybe the whole history of our storytelling, the storytelling of ourselves as groups, that whole history of storytelling of humans perhaps has always been that way in almost any culture, almost every culture. What we're saying here is, in a sense, is that our story is not a true story. Whatever story we need to tell, it's not a true story. And maybe we don't need one story. 
Maybe we can have many stories, all of them not entirely true, maybe kind of some, some claim to some utility, whatever it might be. I really don't know what, how we're going to try to sort this out. But if the idea of there being a, a, a plethora of stories, a plurality of stories, all of them kind of not entirely true. And here's the key one, a very hard one, I think, for Americans in particular, at least certain strands of our culture. None of them is the best story, right? We're not, no one has the one true story. No one has the best story. This kind of a practice is not going to be easy. One of the ways, and especially in the West, in which we are especially challenged by this, is very is precisely by the notion of the good. That there is, in some sense, whatever stories we tell, we can always say at least that they're being they're they're maybe they're all fictions, but they parse maybe they partially participate in the good. They direct us to the good. They enable us to encounter the good. Well, here's something that I was thinking about just last night after reading Evan's very moving and beautiful essay on hope, which I think is not incompatible with this, perhaps, um, is, uh, you know, the Heart Sutra is, is a very interesting document because it in some ways is precisely a sutra that is saying, yes, this, the Buddha story is not true. Right, it, it, the way the Heart Sutra is structured is it goes through all of the most fundamental Buddhist categories and says, nope, nope, nope. Right, in emptiness, meaning in terms of the ultimate, in terms of ultimate reality, there is no eye, there is no nose. It actually is structured according to the Abhidharma account of the human body and the world. Right, there are no, no the four noble truths, nope. I think we need to add into the Heart Sutra for the West is uh, in, in terms of the ultimate, the good does not exist. The right does not exist. That probably sounds kind of challenging. The Buddhists don't have that category. It's really interesting. You, there's no translation of the good into Sanskrit. Right? It's not a category they work with, just like emotions. They don't, the, the Heart Sutra doesn't say there are no emotions because that's not a category they worked with. Right? It also doesn't say the good does not exist ultimately because the good is not something that they worked with, but we do. And that is very much how a lot of our stories are structured. And that I think is in some sense, the hardest one to let go of, to let go of the sense that there's a moral universe, a moral structure to the universe that makes it make sense to us and makes our lives meaningful. That doesn't mean our, minds are, our, our lives are meaningless. It just means that that meaning is made together. I'll leave it at that. John, thank you so much. Stimulating, provocative, and as always, so very clear. Very grateful. So Roshi, to you yeah. as our discussant and leader of this discussion period. Thank you so much. You know, John, as you were speaking, and particularly toward the end, I was recalling an exchange between Dongshan who uh, was one of our Chinese ancestors and who was the founder of the Soto School. A monk asked Dongshan, of the three bodies of the Buddha, which one does not fall into categories? Now this is you know, the perfect question for you, John. Uh, if you know Dongshan's response, <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I used to. <laughs> Could you tell well, me? Well, now, <laughs> uh, but what would you say? Uh, I'd probably, I'd probably resort to the to the lion's war, roar of Queen Srimala in that context. Oh, John, that's a bad <laughs> trope. <laughs> I know. I'm sure I'm a failure as a Zen student. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you you fail uh, as a student of almost anything. But anyway, yeah, indeed. <laughs> Uh, what oh, in, tell the, me, again? Tell me. I've, I, 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 I've heard this one, but I I forget. I I mean the whole. I mean it's Wait, it's, stop, it's, stop. it's a paradox, right? Because the three bodies are already categories. John, you're overthinking it. Okay, <laughs> tell me, tell me, Roshi. A monk asked Dongshan, of the three bodies of the Buddha, which one does not fall into categories? Now John knows well the teaching on the three bodies of the Buddha. And that is the trap. And what did Dongshan say? Dongshan said, I am always intimate with it. Ah, uh, yes, right. 
I'm yes. always intimate with it. And I think this plays right into what you have been speaking to uh, uh, this afternoon. Also what Amy has been speaking to. One is the, this, uh, uh, the issue of colliding narratives, um, which of course is uh, something that we are, you know, in the midst of like uh, hairy potatoes, we're in the bucket of uh, colliding narratives. But one of the points that I think is really important to uh, us at this uh, juncture is to understand that experience is not private. It is never private. And this is, I believe, what Dongshan was pointing to, mm. was this fundamental uh, non-conceptual lived experience enacted you know, in the context of you know, whatever moment is presenting itself, non-separate from it. I am always intimate with it. Um, so I, you know, I wanted to uh, uh, run that one by you just to see if you, if you, uh, how you struggled with with that response. Um, you know, I, I wanted to actually. Uh, I, I'm going to ask each of our speakers, John, to uh, and Amy, to uh, pose a question to you. But um, I want to pose a question to Amy. Um, I am very uh, aware of the uh, pervasiveness of loss that uh, has been the experience of this year, but also is the experience, uh, for example, in the context of war, in the context of famine, in the context of climate refugees fleeing uh, uh, inhospitable uh, situations. When the griefs, or the, sorry, the losses are multiple, how does the, the self uh, interject multiple losses and work with multiple losses? That's a, that's a wonderful question, um, which I can't answer. Um, but <laughs> I, I think that um, uh, well, the association that I make to your question is with actually the thinking of Judith Butler, who some of you might know who's talked a lot about the question of grievability, what bodies are grievable and what, which bodies are grievable and which aren't. And so I thought of in terms of pol the politics of death and the politics of destruction and war and all of that. And uh, we've started in Western countries putting names of people in the newspaper, you know, the names of the dead and making memorials. But then there's this whole swath of people where there are these mass deaths um, and the the um, her, one of her ideas, but it, she elaborates it very beautifully, and I can't do justice to her. Is that um, that um, there are instances or systems that decide on grievability? So I would say, you know, kind of um, fishtailing a little bit that um, there is no differentiation between a mass death and an individual death that there, there would only be a systemic distinction on um, you know, concerning whether in mass deaths, for example, in genocides or in you know, whatever pandemics that um, because there are many, they're less grievable in some way. Mm -hmm. you know, and I think what we're seeing now with the pandemic is, is that every death is an individually grievable death. And so, the question of how to take that in as someone who's sitting, listening in the technosphere to all the news and all of those numbers, I don't know. I mean, how do we live those numbers? That's something that I've thought a lot about of, um, you know, in, in terms of, you know, 6,000 here today and 7,000 there, you know, and I don't know. I think it's an important question for us to explore. And I think that, uh, you know, I, I don't want to just dwell in this subject too, uh, too long, but it's only to say um, when grief is not uh, addressed, recognized, worked with, uh, integrated, when the, the other self is not 
uh, in, interjected. Um, what are the outcomes that uh, the individual experiences, but also what is the social outcome? Um, so I, you know, I wanted just to uh, touch into that question, and you know, it's something I'm trying to put my arms around. Really, I've been trying to put my arms around since the war in Vietnam, yeah. when on television uh, the body count numbers were being shared, and there was increasing alienation or desensitization mm -hmm. to the presence of loss. Mm -hmm. And you know, I, I just wonder how we move forward in terms of the narrative we build around this uh, year of extreme loss, um, uh, making a, a, a bridge into you know, a better normal, so to speak, mm -hmm. based on um, working with the magnitude of loss that uh, we've experienced in multiple levels. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, John, um, I, you know, one of the things that I thought about uh, as you were speaking was uh, Levi Brule's perspective on uh, participation mystique, you know, the, the sort of, you know, when you were talking about collective narratives and uh, the role of ritual or of social enactments that affirm a sense of uh, identity and safety. And I'd love to hear what your perspective is. Well, I think that the um, and some of this has drifted from the context of religion into what you might call civic religion uh, in many contemporary cultures. But it is our you know our capacity to kind of live a shared narrative, to have a shared sense of the meaning of life, is not just something that's abstract. It's also something that we live out through certain types of uh, activities that bring us together to enact those narratives. And so they could be as simple as uh, in the United States, a 4th of July parade, you know, the, the, the singing of Le Marseillaise de, on, uh, on Bastille Day, uh, that these are examples of the kind of civic religion that reenact these types of, uh, uh, of um, narratives. But you can even think of our, um, that ways of dress, you know, and this then connects, of course, not just to Durkheim, but, uh, you know, Pierre Bourdieu, the ways of dress, ways of greeting, ways of eating, all of them can, can be ways of reinforcing that sense of a shared reality that, uh, that really doesn't fall apart until suddenly the other is encountered. So part of what I think is really, uh, you know, critically important uh, is the tendency these days for us to really avoid the other. Uh, in other words, the, it's so easy for us not to participate in that kind of shared reality making um, uh, because we can just get on the internet and, and share reality through uh, in, in, in ways that are much less embodied, for example, but seem to be pretty effective as well. And so we end up in echo chambers. We don't encounter the other. We don't encounter the different uh, the, uh, you know, the sort of irony really of late modernity is that we're all really much more interconnected, but we can be much more interconnected in a way that allows us to completely avoid what we don't want to deal with. And there's a very disembodied quality. Yes. So, you know, this... the, you know, the breakdown in some ways, and this is where the pandemic has been, I think, a huge challenge that uh, there's, and I can't remember, uh, I've read a lot of this through um, um, both Jonathan Haidt and Joshua Green, but you know, part of the way in which the two are both moral psychologists, uh, but part of the way in which, you know, echoing Durkheim, we create these shared realities is actually very physical, like through shared movement, through, through singing together, through chanting together, through eating together, but in a way that's kind of ritualized, like, you know, a formal dinner, for example. And uh, that, you know, the inability to share those very embodied physical experiences and just have this, whatever this is, uh, that actually is, I think, really also impacting this sense of fragmentation in society. Yeah, I was thinking um, as you were speaking about Zen Session, where uh, you know, 70 or 80 people assemble in a room, we engage in uh, uh, codified behaviors. Uh, the first several days, um, almost everyone experiences a lot of resistance, but by the end, there's a kind of mutual entrainment that is so powerful and it liberates an extraordinary kind of energy. 
And uh, I think that's uh, one of the things that's so clear, you know, people talk about doing these practices online, but, you know, if you've done them online and you've done them in vivo or, you know, in the physical space of practice with others, it's a completely different experience. Yeah, absolutely. I totally agree with that. And, you know, you know, sp speaking especially of, you know, uh, a session, another feature here that I, I didn't get into in my talk is really how do we get out of our bubble? You know, how do we, is it, are we just stuck? You know, we've been raised in a particular kind of cultural context with a particular kind of narrative, particular kind of meta narrative universe that, uh, you know, that we were born into. Is that, is that it? Are we just stuck? And one of the you know, positive features you could say of modernity is that that's no longer the case. It probably was the case in many ways for, for many ancient cultures, although you know, the whole Buddhist monastic system was deliberately a way of getting out of that story. And pilgrimage as well. And well, pilgrimage also was a, could be a reenactment of that story. It, would, it probably would be, depend a lot on the context. But we have a lot of opportunities now to, in a sense, leave our story and be exposed to a completely different way of being and of thinking and of what is good and what is valuable and beautiful. Uh, many opportunities, but somehow, you know, that's also destabilizing. It's challenging. It can be, it can fear, feel fearful. Well, I think that's one of the points that I was pointing to yesterday that Francisco makes about the fragility of the self, that it takes, I'm not talking about a poorly uh, integrated individual. I don't think Francisco was meaning that at all. He was speaking more to uh, the fact that moment by moment, the self is arising. Yes. And, and the that self is, is contingent upon, you know, our, our sensory experience, it's contingent upon our conditioning, mm -hmm. upon our aspirations and anticipations. And, and as that as it, the self is completely contingent and, as and therefore it's, fragile. Yes, it's fragile, but, and it, and, you know, quite literally as humans, the, the self, again, can't survive alone. It can't be, you can't be a self alone, both, you know, literally in the sense of survival but also in, in the sense of one's identity, again, as Hazel Marcus, that's almost a direct quote from Hazel Marcus. You can't be yourself alone. You can't even have an identity that is just constructed from your own standpoint. And I think that's, you know, that's a kind of fragility. It's also a kind of, you know, a, a freedom as well. It's an opportunity. But So I, what I'd like to do is to um, uh, invite Richie to comment on the two presentations, and then I'm going to ask Adam, the physicist, and uh, Ev. Thank you, Roshi. And Amy. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Roshi. And uh, they were um, both amazing presentations. Uh, one of the notes I sent to Amy was that I thought that her description, the phenomenological description of how um, environmental cues can trigger somatic responses yeah. associated with memory uh, is, um, it was really precious. And the, uh, just some of the richest phenomenological description of uh, embodied emotional memory that I've heard. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, uh, I think that um, it, you know, what it, it really points to the importance of uh, the body in uh, uh, in memory recall, which is really something that has not been mm -hmm. systematically addressed in modern um, psychological science, and uh, uh, I thought you you did such a um, beautiful job of bringing attention to that. Um, and I'll be brief here. Um, John, I, I loved your, your talk. One of the things that uh, I was thinking about as you were talking is that one of these groups which um, that creates uh, a shared story that has very powerful effects in our culture is science. And- um, Exactly, uh, and, yes. Uh, uh, and, uh, you know, uh, sometimes, consensual validation is mutual self-deception. <laughs> uh, and, and that is, 
I mean, that is so unrecognized <laughs> um, by the mainstream scientific community. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, I think that this is such an important perspective uh, that uh, is so relevant to, um, uh, to the stories that scientists create. But of course, um, the, the dominant view is that they're, they're actually uh, uncovering objective reality. Yes. Uh, yeah. One and one of the I just say really comment very quickly. One of the things you know I like Peter Singer and Josh Joshua Green also talks about this, the idea that we have in really kind of multiple group identities that are like overlapping or intersecting or maybe one circle inside of another, another, another. And when pre pressure is put on one, there's a challenge. There's limited resources, whatever, you sort of collapse inward. So maybe you're an American, but enough pressure comes in. Now you're a Democrat, enough pressure comes in, and now you're a Madisonian or whatever it is, you know, all the way down to your family. And also the other feature of science that's really interesting is how it kind of participates in these different circles, even for individual scientists, you know, at what point does your, what's the core identity, science, being a scientist or being something else? So, but I love the idea of it. Yeah, it's definitely... All of these stories are in a certain way a matter of, you know, uh, a common delusion, right? At a yes, certain level. absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So thank you. Thank you, Richie. Adam. Um, it's very much uh, so much to sort of think about for both of the talks. Um, Amy, I just wanted to actually, if I could just, if I could ask, I'd like to ask questions to each of you, but the, Amy, for the building on a little bit on what Roshi was saying, um, not so much the sort of the systemic part of like, how does society decide how, you know, who's grievable and not, but more, because one of the things that, that happened in this horrible year is I ended up somehow sort of beginning to look at refugee camps and what's going on in refugee camps, just, you know, thinking about human suffering. And, you know, also since my own family, my, the Holocaust, you know, story in my own family, how do individuals, like, you know, if you're counseling or it's not even if you're counseling them, when there's more than just one loss, when it's more than just, oh, I lost my, you know, I, I lost my, my brother or something, or I, you know, how do individuals, because some do, you know, I mean, my own stories of my family members, how do human beings deal with so much loss? Yeah. You know, what, is the, what is the process that allows people to somehow make it through losing their homes and their cultures and they're in a refugee camp and they're, you know, it's stunning because uh, yeah, how much loss can we deal with? And yet somehow we do. Yeah, well, once again, you know, I wish I could tell you. And in fact, if I knew, you know, I would probably be the most famous person in the world. <laughs> um, because I really don't. I mean, I you know I work with individuals. Of course, I've thought about the the these questions a lot, as that we all have been doing. And you know, when you think about climate change and people's houses falling into the water, I mean, you know, whole bits of continents are going to probably uh, you know the, the geography of the world is going to change, and the human geography is going to change. Um, so I, you know, I think on this personal level, on the on the individual level, I I really, you know, do believe what I said that what happens when you grieve and when you're accompanied. I mean, that's you know what I'm seeing when you're accompanied in this grieving process, which is um, which is um, important, and it's what I do. Is is that you are doing something like a practice. Mm. Um, and so, you know, it's a kind of a, you know, a non-answer answer, answer, but the fact is, is that there is a practice that, that goes on there. And I mentioned that it, it really resembles a, a developmental stage. And so that would be, on an individual level, my answer is, is that people move ahead through them. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not just getting over it. It's, it's, yeah. uh, it's, you know, move, you know, and this I've seen many times in my life and also in, in the lives of my patients um, is, is that when, when you can do the type of work that I described there um, of um, letting yourself be undone and redoing and undone and redoing. And in particular, this part that's maybe the bodily memory that Richie mentioned, working with that, um, uh, 
um, then you're moving ahead. So it's not like every time you get the same hit, you could say. Um, now, of course, I've, you know, I've known people during the pandemic who've had, you know, a number of hits at the same time and, and they're, you know, um, it's, it's, not, it's not the same story. I mean, when you have four or five people, not to mention thousands around you dropping, you know, it's, it's definitely not the same story, but I suspect that there's a, there, you know, a whole, there definitely a whole variety of different ways. What John was talking about is also a way, I mean, mourning is a collective process and you have all these, these, uh, these mechanisms of group groupiness in order to deal with them as well. You know, the, the method I was talking about is really a very, um, um, you know, not necessarily individual, but um, um, I guess the phenomenology of it is important because I think we do it, but it's different if people know they're doing it when they're doing it. Mm -hmm. And this is why I like thinking about this is, is that um, because the more you become aware of all of these sort of micro activities within you, um, the more you can also be aware when you see it in some ways see it happening in someone else and you can point it out and um, in some ways you're making another story you know but that awareness also allows you to advance in the process so that's you know i'm um remembering uh going to auschwitz with glassman roshi mm. and 130 of us 150 of us sitting on the selection site and the names of those who died in Auschwitz in the four quarters um, were offered. And um, it was so big, the feeling that I could not put my arms around it, so to speak. It was not intimate until uh, what I uh, experienced when in the Auschwitz Museum, seeing photographs of some of the young people and then that sense of intimacy, suddenly uh, something broke open in me. Mm -hmm. And I realized that um, had I been alone uh, and on this pilgrimage by myself, so to speak, it would have been completely different. Uh, the power of the collective of the 150 of us sitting there on the selection site, the 150 of us going to the crematoria, um, uh, and then gazing into the faces of those um, whom we could access through these old photographs. And um, what I, you know, I asked the question of you, Amy, because um, it was another kind of, uh, it was a, a non-pathological sensitization to mass loss, mm -hmm. if you know what I'm saying. In other words, one could be overwhelmed. Yeah. But um, the burden was shared, if you will, mm -hmm. by enough of us um, that uh, something, and Bernie's point was, we sit here with not knowing, we bear witness. And then his great imperative was, you know, how do we never let something like this happen again? That was his imperative. Yeah. So um, you're, the you're end of this little story is, uh, in the, the seventh day of that retreat, uh, when the, the rabbi broke out into this incredible song and Peter Matheson turned to me and said, how in this horrible place can we have a moment like this? And he didn't say it as a downer. It was really, you know, it was an upliftment, so to speak that it was a kind of breakthrough, collective breakthrough that we, we experienced together, which was, you know, very reinforcing of our collective resolve. Um, I had another question for John, but I think we're going on. So I think John and I will duke it out. You confer. I wanna invite Elena. I was just commenting um, in the chat, which I don't think all the participants can see, right? No. In the chat for panelists. So maybe it's worth bringing this um, um, uh, in. Um, some of the work I'm familiar with on the resilience, um, the aspect uh, that often comes up is that of gratitude. Mm. 
that ability to to appreciate to value what is left um which is not thought based it also has this visceral qualities the sort of driving force that keeps one going and it might be as little as one breath left but that sort of gratitude that somehow is at the center of the being rather than something that is um brought in you know has to be worked on refreshed moment by moment it's, it's more like a sweat that seems to just some people describe it as even spontaneously rising as a kind of almost a paradox as a antithesis to the loss that has been um that that one has undergone it's a beautiful perspective thank you so much elena very interesting it, what you're saying elena also reminds me of um what some people and some patients who've had multiple losses say that after a moment, it's all one thing. That doesn't mean that they don't individually grieve, um, but that um, recently, in fact, a patient um, went to the funeral of someone who, who had died of COVID, in fact, who she didn't know particularly well, but she knew the, the family. And she, she, said, she said that to me in the office. She said, um, I was crying my eyes out. You know, <laughs> this person I didn't know, but I realized we all were crying for one thing. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's, it's probably a little bit something like bring, bursting into song, but it's a shared, um, it's a shared moment, but that there's, there's something um, very singular and individual about each death in my life. And yet, each time I go through grief, um, I feel like I'm joining um, mm. um, with something that's a, that's a whole. You know that that uh, Francisco's death or my father's death or my mother's death that it's it, it's in a way one thing. And that's all, that that idea has actually always interested me. I'd be very curious if anybody had any ideas about it, like John. <laughs> Before John, <laughs> John, uh, do you have something you'd like to share? No, no, I, that's too hard a question for me. <laughs> <laughs> see. Okay, Hannah. Uh, very difficult. <laughs> um, I have. I was thinking through all of this um, about how threats of loss also come before we lose people, mm -hmm. I think. Um, I say that because, in part, because my father died of dementia. And so we lost him for a very long time before he died. And so there was, in a sense, grief before he died for years. And, and so the grief after he died wasn't so harsh in some way, I think, because there was a long, long period of losing him. And, and so again, I think that the experience, like I said this morning to Evan's talk, that in, in the past, th there's a thread to, to, the, to the future and how we experience things that also has yeah, tentacles into the past, I think. And, um, and even also fear of losing loved ones, I guess, is something like that where, um, yeah. Yeah. This this <laughs> time extends in a way uh, in loss and in grief. I think, um, and it it not only backwards and forwards in past and future, but also um, like in relation to John's talk, um, sideways because we share with other people and and. So pe people have our back. We we can say when we when 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 we share something, we 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 can move together in the in the loss maybe mm -hmm. and in how in dealing with it and maybe in breathing together um, to deal with it. So so in a way, time extends and and sense making extends in different directions around these things. It's, no, no matter how pointed, also the experience can be because. Certainly, loss can be very pointed and very sharp. Yeah, I don't know. Anna, thank you. Um, 
I think those of us who are uh, Buddhists are very aware that um, the truth of impermanence prevails. Uh, loss is inevitable. And how do we actually work that in our life as something that is liberating um, and not uh, defeating? Evan. There's uh, so much <laughs> to, uh, well, both to take in and to, and to respond to. Um, so a few, a few thoughts in response to the discussion now and to the two talks from, from Amy and John. So just now, most immediately, uh, I very much share this feeling that I, that I heard you talking about, Amy, of the, the singularity of each loss and of each grief. And then strangely, the way that they, I almost think of it as like a hall of mirrors that they, they reflect each other or they, or they, they almost like Indra's net, they sort of interpenetrate with each other. I mean, this year against the backdrop of the pandemic, I've lost five mm -hmm. close people. The, the one most recently was several days ago this week, someone, best friend from graduate school who died unexpectedly of a heart attack. And every loss, every grief, is is singular is irreplaceable is unique and yet strangely they reflect each other and i've had this thought especially pronounced this week and i can't quite wrap my mind around it um i probably will never be able to wrap my mind about it which is fine but it's it's a it's yeah it's a very that resonates with me quite a bit a very it's a very powerful and moving moving thought and it's very much also tied to what you were talking about of the somatic dimensions of of memory and our involvement with others that you know writers like proust as you know of course you know evoke so strongly proust and and bergson as a philosopher so these these are these are just thoughts that are coming to me kind of free, in a free-flowing way and then i had a thought in response to john's talk that um that that connects back to francisco and to something I talked about in the uh, in the Ouroboros seminar, I, I gave a talk about Francisco's paper, not one, not two. And in the context of talking about that paper, I also said some things about his talk that he gave to Lindisfarne in 1978, Reflections on the Chilean Civil War. And one of the things he he says, he says at the very end of that talk, he says, I'll actually, I'll, I'll read to you exactly what he says. He says, if I am interested in doing anything at this point, it is in creating a form of culture, knowledge, religion, or politics that does not view itself as replacing another mm -hmm. in any sense, but one that can contain in itself a way of undoing itself. Mm -hmm. So I hear in the, the thought of not replacing you know, replacement is a certain way of framing time. Here's one thing, we're gonna supersede it, we're gonna replace it, it's gonna be better. That's the modernist narrative, right? Um, and here he's saying, no, I don't wanna do that. I, I want to think about it differently. And what's important for him is that whatever we do, whatever we enact, and this is, I think, the idea of wisdom, we have some kind of, we work to have some kind of insight into how we are constructing that so that we can flexibly move into something else by by undoing he doesn't mean you know like going backwards he means that we can change our stance and i see this also this is still in relation to john's talk you know where you brought out the the heart sutra i see this in a way as the maybe i would even put it in somewhat grandiose terms as the as the special mission of the apophatic traditions. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the heart suture is an, is apophatic in the, you know, in the sense that it's about negation. It, it takes all of the Buddhist concepts and categories and negates them. <laughs> and that's what apophatic thinkers do, whether it's, you know, John Scotus Aragena or Plotinus or the, you know, the, or Nagarjuna. And that I think is an extremely important dimension of practice and thought that I also see exemplified in, you know, mystical thinkers like Simone Weil, uh, Gabriel Marcel is participating in that to some extent. And I think, you know, there's never been as anything as powerfully constructive as science. And if we don't 
have that apophatic awareness in our scientific practice, then I think we're really, you know, we're really in peril. Mm -hmm. And so I just offer that as a, as a, as a thought. Th thank you. Evan, Evan, could I ask you, what about, I totally agree with you. And I think Richie was kind of touching into that too, like the apophasis, but, um, you know, and speaking of apophasis, let's talk about cataphasis, where, you know, often even in the apophatic traditions, what somehow emerges at the end is the good. What about that issue of mm. even, you know, in a certain way, there is a, um, again, because it's not a category, it just isn't in the Heart Sutra. Yeah. But so I do wonder whether we're, there is a place right now in, in especially kind of your American culture where the moral, as the final structure of our stories is uh, actually putting us in peril. Yeah, I, that, I mean, that that's a very interesting uh, question that we could have a whole Verla symposium on, I suppose. But um, I, I do think there is a very interesting difference between a lineage of thought that comes out of, let's say, you know, the Mediterranean world in Greece and then flows through you know, Christianity, Islam also gets taken up by Judaism, where the good is an orienting concept. But but even there, the apophatic traditions, if you will, negate or deconstruct that that concept in various ways. So there's a recognition of of that as a as a kind of orienting idea or concept, but also a recognition of its unframability, its ineffability, of the need to stop talking about it. Um, and I, and, and I don't think it's, I, so I don't think the concept is moral in the sense in which we would use the term moral to refer to, to codes of behavior or norms in that sense. It's not, it's not a moral, it's an ethical concept. It's or axiological is maybe better. Yeah. 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 So I want to be uh, aware of the time. Um, and uh, thank you so much for uh, these contributions. I, I very, uh, I, I see we have um, a, a, a bigger landscape now before us than uh, we had anticipated. And in that regard to uh, complete this exchange with again, some words from Francisco. Uh, he said, a life of wisdom is to be constantly engaged in letting go and letting the fragility of the self manifest itself. A life of wisdom is to be constantly engaged in letting go and letting the fragility of the self manifest itself. So on that note, um, thank you so much. Uh, Amy, John, thank you, Hannah, for uh, your remarks. Thank you so much, Elena, uh, Al, Ev. And uh, the, the uh, shape of uh, the near future is at 5.30. We'll actually just have completely silent and guideless meditation. Uh, you'll join the residents in the Zendo. And then seven o'clock in the morning, actually, John will be leading meditation uh, and uh, seven to eight. And then at 10 o'clock, we gather and um, we will begin with a presentation by Richie. So thank you so much. And Al, thank you. Thank you, Roshi. We'll see you later in the Zendo and tomorrow. Bye-bye.